Welcome to Captured by Women, our all women host show tackling trending issues from a women's perspective. My name is Elizabeth Olympio Emanuel and I'm a restaurateur. I'm joined today by my wonderful co presenters Nancy Vukania. I'm a management consultant doubling in PR and agribusiness and I also work as a broadcaster. My name is Lila Wusu and I'm an entrepreneur. In this episode of Captured by Women, we will be tackling the frustrations of the Special Prosecutor, Martin Amidu. We discuss the detention and possible aftermath for the actions of Lance Corporal Wasa Lincoln Isaac, the soldier who was captured in a viral video campaigning against the proposed new parliamentary complex under the hashtag, Drop That Chamber. Earlier this year, some residents of the Volta region aired secession from, from Ghana on account of a plebiscite dating back to the independence era. Are their claims legitimate? We bring you an interview with Mr. Koshi Kedem, historian who's published widely on the historic plebiscite. Captured by Women is proudly sponsored by Woodin Le Createur. If you want to look smart and fashionable, visit any Woodin boutique nationwide today. Woodin offers an amazing collection of authentic African fabrics and ready to wear that come in beautiful designs and colors for men and women. With Woodin, you can get creative and versatile with your designs. Be confident and show off how truly African you are in Woodin. Go to a Woodin boutique near you today and choose from a variety of trendy products to complement your unique style. Follow Woodin Fashion on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Woodin Le Createur. Our location today of Captured by Women is by kind courtesy of Emerald Properties. We will be back with a spin right after the break. Is Special Prosecutor Martin Amidu being frustrated by state institutions or he's making up too many excuses? Are his concerns legitimate? Martin Amidu, in his latest statements to the press, detailed the challenges of the newly created Office of the Special Prosecutor in executing its mandate of fighting corruption, accused heads of institutions of disregarding anti-corruption regulations. In this session of The Spin, we will discuss the pros and cons of his statement. Ladies, do you think he's been sabotaged? I, I, I think he probably is being challenged. I think sabotage is a rather strong word to use for this one. Okay. Um, I, I believe that he's faced a litany of challenges, you know, from you know, the said institutions. Um, he didn't really mention names, he put it in a blank, state institutions. And um, it's, it's, he's been very challenged in his quest to fight corruption in the country. And I think that if this is not checked, you know, the purpose for which the office was established will be defeated. Um, his main claims, he says, were the fact that he was unable to, you know, collect the information that he needed from these institutions, you know, whenever they he sent a request to release, there is to release information and quote unquote, personally, mm -hmm. I think that the information that he's, he's asking for may contain elements uh, which may incriminate some people, people yeah. and um, maybe that's, that's, that's why they've been reluctant to do that. But I think that he has a genuine, this is a genuine concern and he's not just making this up. I mean, we know the guy, Yeah. you know, and so yeah. much expectation, now the guy is so here. So much expectation. We're not seeing, you and, know. And I think um, appointing him as special prosecutor has more or less tied him from these um, It's just, you know, it's just like, just like the military thing. I mean, once you're there, then now you can't really you just have come to out. Go with a code of conduct. Right, yeah. you have but to do you know, procedure. Some people also think that his job is a duplication of the AG department. Absolutely. You know? So, I mean, it could be that... There is that school of thought as well. Exactly, because they don't want to support, you know, he's not getting the needed support that he yeah. needs because if he's doing the same thing that they're doing, what's the point? I mean, his, his, you see, the AG department is charged to take care of all cases but he's 
charged to take care of government official corruption corruption within by, the government setup yes right. exactly mm -hmm. so it's rather specific i mean i can agree to some extent that he's doing i mean he's doing part of what the ag is already doing mm -hmm. but he's been given a special mandate it's and it's, you know. it's a rule that is not new it's, no it exists it's not. in many countries it does special it prosecutor does. Yeah. tackling government officials yes. state institutions and he comes with a neutrality that the AG that the AG government, may the not AG be able to wield. office is not yeah. is not under. Yeah. yeah, and he may not have all that neutrality because remember he used to be a former. Uh, presidential candidate mm, on mm. the ticket of the NDC. Vice, I think. Yeah, vice presidential mm, yeah. candidate, but, but, exactly. But so when you look at it, when his name was put up, it was because everyone perceived him to be very straight and he, narrow. Yes. Not partisan. He, he did assert you know? himself to be neutral. And I think even, even supposedly even some people in the NDC protested. Yes. You know, so it's not like he's there for NDC because or be, he's there for NPP. Yeah. He's, he's there, there to there make sure Ghana. the right thing is done. So mm. then you know? it leads us to the point that then our, our assertions, our suspicions that he's being tied and um, state is, leaders of the state institutions, heads of the mm. uh, state institutions <laughs> are covering up their colleagues to ensure that they don't get prosecuted. Mm. Because by this time, we should have at least one or two because we hear a lot of stories mm. in the media of... Um, Corruption, misappropriation of funds. Mm. Um, uh, what do you call it? The um, sole sole sourcing soul of some mm -hmm. projects. The, the procurement are, issues. Yeah. Not, yeah. I think yes. I think for for these um, challenges he's facing, he has sort of two options to explore. He can either go straight to the AG's office and sue, mm -hmm. you know, these heads of institutions, or he could use go through the high courts, you know. So he does have some sort of you know, as a um, special prosecutor, he can go to yes, the high court. Well, go, supposedly, can, the president can. has even come out to plead with the heads of institutions yeah. to actually work with him. But it's not happening. Yes. So, heads so. are being taken to court, they are charged, but then they go back to work again. Mm. How can we investigate if you're still yeah. doing what supposedly you were doing that's I think making there was a trouble. recent one that was removed from office and recently given another position in a high profile position imagine that and it's cause it's, there's a lot of chitter chatter mm -hmm. about it in the public domain so i i think he needs to be more forceful I mean, in getting what he wants well, done but technically, how does he, how do, does he that? do that because then, technically this action by these heads institutes uh, constitutes sorry interference what is with it? the investigations? Mm -hmm. So it is an offense. What is it that the SP, the special prosecutor, needs that he's not getting? Is it only the information or he's financially manpower. constrained as I well? I think manpower. Um, because okay. he, he, accordingly, he's hmm. all, he only has three seconded investigators from the Ghana Police Service yes. with no prosecutor employed by, directly by the office. How is he supposed to do his work? Can he hire from the public? No, he, I don't think he can. Um, he can't. His, his, his office is a government agency and so it's supposed to, to be staffed mm -hmm. from there. Staffed by mm -hmm. government. And, um, you know, these things, we've, I think we've discussed this issue before. These things take a while. And um, when you set up a government institution, sometimes it takes two or three years mm -hmm. and to it get shouldn't. it functioning it properly. But you see, the expectation for this particular office was so high that we thought that, you know, it initially everything in was ready exactly. and, you know, prepared. It's unfortunate he but has I think he did those... tackle one, or one case from the former um, NBC. Mm. Mahama Yariga. Yes, Mahama yes. Yariga. But at the end of the day, the... I mean, he's the, still tackling it. The statement was tackling. not... Tackling. I think the charge sheet was not properly worded. Filed. Mm -hmm. Filed. And then it, he... he Maybe they're going to go no, back no, to that. No, he's, no, he's actually still, you know, these things take a while. He's yeah. actually still working on that case. So that's, that's but it's, I think it's quite unfair that people think that he's making excuses. I think that he's genuinely challenged by the staffing issues because mm -hmm. he needs uh, uh, private investigators. He needs uh, policemen. He needs uh, other lawyers, yeah. you know, to work with him. He and needs then again, he needs to be staff. meticulous yeah. because he needs to make sure yeah. he's lined up all his ducks in a row. And he's, he's known so for he that. So he doesn't act. get yeah. thrown out in court. Actually. So I think he's, he's genuinely facing these challenges. And if, if the president doesn't make a move or if whoever is in a position to do something about it doesn't, then it's going to be, it's going to be a whole roller coaster of taking heads of every institution to the courts. And, yeah. mm -hmm. and you know, and it's just, yeah, it's going to be a mess. A special prosecutor Martin Amidou does have genuine concerns yes. regarding his frustrations yes. by heads of state institutions. And things must give and uh, allow him to do his job. Oh, we want exactly. to see him 
uh, effective because he is yeah. a good resource. Somebody has to take some action. Exactly. Yeah. And we to all need to be him. a part of it. You right. know, Precisely. One person can't fight corruption. No. We all need to be we a part of it. It looks as if he, we've, we've put the whole thing on his shoulders to carry. Exactly. That's quite ridiculous, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> I think it's, it's now our yeah. turn as citizens to support the citizens and of not Vigilante. Be spectators. Right. <laughs> and not be spectators. <laughs> Over to you, Lila. Well, <laughs> we'll be right back after the break. You're welcome back from the break and you're still watching Capture Thy Women. This program is sponsored by Emerald Apartments and Woudine Le Createur. Now, if you can well remember, uh, over the past month or so, there's been this huge campaign on social media with the hashtag Drop That Chamber. Now, a military personnel has been involved in this Drop That Chamber campaign and um, he has been handed uh, some days of detention and um, we have with us uh, today Colonel Festus Abwaje. He's a security expert and also a consultant for the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Center. He's going to talk to us about the aftermath of this military personnel's detention. You're welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thanks to all of you. Well, Colonel, um, we've all heard about this issue and we just want to know um, what it is like with the military. I mean, this man is not a civilian and surely he, he may have flouted some rules of the military, but like most civilians, um, I do not know or we do not know what the military uh, will do in a case like this. So we'd be glad if you could just let us know, just a little insight into, into what's going to happen to this man. Or what has happened. Or what has happened, yeah. <laughs> anyway, thanks for having me once again. Um, I think what we know from the media mm. is related to the video that circulated on social media. Right. And subsequent to that, we have all been informed, <clears throat> rightly or wrongly, that he has been charged and brought before his commanding officer. Yes. He happens to belong to the second reconnaissance squadron of the armored regiment in Sujuani. Okay. But at the, the time recce? of the incident, yes, the okay. he was attending a course or had just completed a course. Right. So invariably, even if he had been in Sujuani, probably his officer commanding giving consideration to his powers of command as a major might have decided that the case must be referred to the commanding officer. But be it as it may, he appeared before the commanding officer okay. and I presume that he was found guilty and sentenced. <clears throat> and this is where the technicality sets in. The oh. commanding officer has powers of command or powers of punishment up to 30 days detention. 30 days? Yes. Oh, it was in the media that it was 90 days or so. I will explain. Yeah. Okay. So you can award a maximum of 30 days. Okay. Now, any number of days beyond 30 days to 90 days oh. must be sent for approval by what we call the appropriate superior authority, who would be the now general officer commanding southern command okay but the armed forces regulations allow the detention of any soldier who is suspected of being about to commit an offense or in the process of committing an offense or having been charged for that matter okay so he is in detention Okay. Serving the 30 days that the commanding officer has the powers to uh, award. And in time, the appropriate superior officer, who is the general officer commanding Southern Command, you know, on the beach road before right. military academy and training schools, will grant the approval. Either the full approval or any portions of the extra 60 days. Okay. I don't want to hazard a guess, but it's not likely that uh, he's going to get less than the 90 days. 
Wow. So, so after these, let's say he gets the 90 days. Mm. Yes. What happens to him afterwards? We enter into another technical domain. <clears throat> so we now need to move from the Armed Forces regulations relating to discipline okay. and go to the Armed Forces regulations relating to administration. Okay. And in that administration volume, which is volume one, um, any offense that is charged as a matter of indiscipline under volume two can then be invoked within volume one for administrative release. That's very technical. So the Try punishment is not a release. Okay. The punishment is the award of the 90 days uh, right. sentence in hard labor or whatever it is. Now, the release from the armed forces within the provisions of volume one, oh. let's call it consequential. Okay. It arises from Out the of. nature of the offense or the gravity of the offense that the soldier committed. Mm. But um, again, it's not automatic. So... There may be many considerations? Um, there could be some considerations, but putting everything together, it's likely that you will be released. So he was a Lance Corporal? Or yes. He is, was a Lance Corporal because he was demoted, right? from a lance corporal to understand the ranks in the army. You can't go lance... beyond or below a private soldier. Private so soldier. you start from a private soldier. And the next <laughs> and then rank is the you lance You move to corporal. lance corporal as okay, a junior so NCO. You're not yet a full NCO. When you become a corporal. NCO standing for? Non-commissioned officer. Non-commissioned oh. officer. So as a corporal, you are an NCO. OK. And then so when you become a, a sergeant, yet. no. You then become wow. a senior NCO. Then after staff sergeant to warrant officer, from warrant officer you become warrant officer class one, a warrant officer. Mm. And then okay. after that level, you then come to the officer corps, starting from second lieutenant. Okay. Oh. To assist our viewers to understand the training involved in getting to the stage of a Lance Corporal, um, from mm. enlisting for training, to the point where mm. you become a Lance Corporal? You know, it's been a while since I left the system. <laughs> <laughs> Although I served, I served many years within yeah. the training establishment. Okay, yeah. great. But um, you leave the training school at Shire Hills currently. Mm. And then you leave as a, as, as a private soldier. Okay. Right. A few of them with good performance from that school may exit with the rank of Lance Corporal. I think you need to serve a minimum of six months or one year or whatever it is, I can't remember. Then you may be considered for promotion to um, Lance Corporal right. based on good performance, good conduct and so on. Right. But a soldier who excels himself or herself under any circumstances, yes. even if that soldier hadn't served the required time, could be given a Lance Corporal rank. See upon you. recommendation by the commanding officer or the officer commanding. I want to assume that he's a good, uh, yeah, yeah he, he is a good um, junior NCO, oh. you know, to have earned that rank. Otherwise, there are people or there used to be people who could be private soldiers for years, oh, yeah. you know. So the promotion to the rank of Lance Corporal or appointment for that matter, oh. um, it's not automatic. Yeah. Well, let me go back okay, so. to the run-up to our last elections, mm. where we had a uh, few army officers mm. involved in the Kalipo challenge. How mm. different was that action from this um, Lance Corporal Wasser's yeah. um, outburst on social media? Mm. I'm glad you used the word outburst. Who suggests, and many of us, including myself, have been asking, uh. what might have prompted him, to do upset did. him, mm -hmm. angered him, annoyed him. You can use any of those uh, words. Mm. To have gone to the extent of putting himself before a camera, right. videoing it, and putting it on social media. And I assume rightly that he knew the consequences. In mm. fact, he knew to start with that as a person in uniform, he should not 
engage in that kind of behavior or yeah. conduct or whatever. So something might have might have triggered that. Oh. Um, nevertheless, well, that there is there is the element of planning. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's not a mere matter of being Just annoyed. Right. Once you got together your camera, put it on a tripod or whatever stand, rehearsed maybe what you were going to say. Yeah. There has been some planning, and therefore there has been the intention that you intended to conduct yourself or misconduct yourself in that manner. Mm. Now we come to the Calipo matter. Anybody can drink Calipo, I suppose. <laughs> I wasn't in the country at the time, but I saw it. So Calipo, at the time of the elections, became a symbol of political activism. Correct. Yeah championed by the incumbent president. Right. And therefore, one needed to be careful not to you know, be associated in such a manner to suggest that you are inclined, aligned with or to yeah. the president's party. Right. It will be very difficult to prove the intention uh, in, in both cases. They are similar, but they are also uh, dissimilar. Oh, yeah. uh, they all connoted political messages, oh. you know, subject to interpretation by whoever wants to interpret those uh, messages. It, it leads me to, to think, I mm. mean, what would constitute indiscipline mm. or offensive exactly. behavior yeah. in the military? Because, I mean, looking at uh, for, mm. from a civilian mind like mm. mine, mm. this seems rather restrictive. Um, this, this thing was done by many other civilians mm. in Parliament. You know, somebody even dropped down the chamber and I mean, there was a lot of drama around it. So it, it seems rather restrictive. And it would be nice to know what constitutes indiscipline mm. or, mm. you know, uh, offensive behavior in the military that could lead to somebody being See, discharged. The, the military is a profession and all professions have code of conduct or ethics, right. you know, that they must, you know, uh, comply with. So once you belong to a professional body or association, immediately you've compromised your freedoms. And therefore those of us who join the armed forces and those who are still in, mm -hmm. accept that compromise, that for the love of the profession, which ultimately is to help to secure the country. We prepare to forego some of our freedoms, our rights, and right. so on. And right from inception, whether you went to the uh, training school or you went to the military academy, that idea will be drummed into your, your, heart, your yeah. brain. So we have specifically what we call Article 54, which is the omnibus. Hmm. article. If anybody does anything that you cannot find a specific provision hmm. in any regulation, constitution, whatever it is, you go to Article 54. Okay. It's the omnibus That's clause. Like the Holy Grail. Now what it says is that any act, any conduct, any disorder or neglect to the prejudice of good order and discipline shall be an offense and every person convicted thereof shall be liable to dismissal with disgrace from the armed forces. So we may not be able to define what indiscipline is, but there are examples of indiscipline right. that will be taught alongside what this clause says. For instance, being drunk in uniform, misbehaving yourself, involved in an affray, um, assaulting, uh, in discipline, in the presence of a superior officer, uh. or offering violence to a subordinate person. All right. When you see in discipline, you know in discipline. You know now, because the body of armed forces regulations and the constitution proscribe persons in uniform in any of the security services from participation in political party activity, it is an offense oh. for any uniformed person. It's not only the armed forces, it's only also the police, it's also the prisons, it's the fire service, the customs and so on. That at any point in time that you decide to enter into politics, 
you need to leave the service. Yes, but, but Kendall, mm. if you think about it, mm. I watched the video mm -hmm. and I saw him pleading to the sensibilities of Ghanaians mm -hmm. and to the president mm -hmm. that 200 million for a chamber doesn't mm -hmm. make sense. Yeah. Yeah. There are a whole lot of projects mm -hmm. that, I mean, it can be put to good use. He mm -hmm. mentioned schools, yeah. hospitals School and stuff, and so on. you know. I think as civilians, we find that very hard to, to accept. maybe that, accept yeah. that he should be punished for that. For this. Because I, I looked, I looked at that. They said his behavior violates the military's rules of engagement. Mm. So according to volume, if I may read, mm, okay, volume yeah. one, article nineteen, section fourteen, yeah. subsection two, that's right, which deals with the improper conduct by officers, says that. Mm -hmm. No officer or man shall do or say anything mm -hmm. which, if seen or heard by any member of the public, mm -hmm. might reflect discredit on the armed forces or any of its members. Mm -hmm. yes. I have a problem here because, to me, I don't see how that's discrediting the armed forces. Yes. Or its members. Or his yeah. members. Yes. So maybe you can help us as civilians to understand yes. this point. So what I'm trying to suggest to you is that you need to place the video and its content mm. in the context of what the armed forces stands for. Right. And what members of the armed forces are allowed or not allowed to do. Mm. Now imagine that each time a soldier had any issue with anything in the state, that soldier went to TV3, mm -hmm. uh, Adum, <laughs> and publicly voice their opinion. Yeah. Imagine that kind of situation. See, then you get in a situation where members of the armed forces, instead of being apolitical, and this was a political message mm -hmm. that he was sending, mm -hmm. instead of being apolitical and nonpartisan, mm -hmm. he's taking a political stance. And the notion that members of the armed forces are taking political stances mm -hmm. doesn't all go well for national security. I don't think That's it's a political exactly. stance. So for yes. civilians, no, we just was. don't see it like it, that. It was. How would it be political? Because it was, I mean, it was it bipartisan. Wasn't partisan. Yeah. You yeah. see, yes. all, all. as a soldier, mm -hmm. he is not allowed to address the president directly. Oh, so we okay, have the channels that. of command and maybe communication that. and control mm -hmm. that if you have any issue, there are mechanisms and structures within the armed forces. And one of them is what people have been calling the DEBA. Okay. At a DEBA, which is a privileged, in quotes, a privileged forum, mm -hmm. any soldier, and I'm aware, I've been aware of soldiers having said many, many things for which they could have been hanged, if they had said those things outside, outside of the, the DEBA, of the DEBA the environment. Mm -hmm. In fact, when politicians and very senior officers had visited units, sometimes very troublesome soldiers have been hidden in rooms. Mm. Because the sergeant majors knew that if they allowed that soldier elements, to be present, yeah. Yeah. he was going to embarrass the unit. Mm. And he couldn't be charged. Oh, so so yeah. what the soldier did was that, even by communicating directly to the president, to the commander in chief, more conveying or less. that message through social media, in itself, was wrong. You see, he could, at a deba, and I cannot think of any other forum mm. where he would have been. In fact, the other opportunity that you would have had is that come elections, you have calculated that given A, B, C, D, a certain government in power, is not worth your vote. Mm. Then you exercise your right your franchise. to or your franchise yeah. to go to the ballot and cast your ballot against that particular party or government. That is what you can do, but you cannot. And I want to subscribe and associate myself Unfortunately, you don't subscribe to that. That <laughs> we cannot allow persons in uniform yes. to overtly, mm. you know, convey messages of a political nature. nature. It will damage the esprit de corps of the it armed forces. The military. Yeah, because everybody in the army mm. who mm. casts their vote. Military, mm. military persons do not have a public social life. It would oh, we have. No. They Look, they we can, we can go themselves. to the mess. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm. But that is still a military installation. Yes, it is. Yeah. We yes. can go to the mess. We can have a discussion mm. about any uh, matter. Mm. But even in the armed forces regulations, we are told not to discuss. There are two things you don't discuss at the mess. Which are? Religion? No. One is 
politics. politics. Okay. The other one is women or ladies. <laughs> Really? Yes, from oh. from the time that okay. you become are you an officer, retired, you are told you are retired. You don't go to a mess <laughs> and know, and right? put a lady on the spot yeah. oh, and disguise a lady. Way. Okay. Yeah, okay. You see what okay. I mean? Okay. So even in the mess, but at a at a beer bar, drinking sport, wherever, we all have opinions. Right. And indeed, when soldiers casia, we might probably not be aware. Mm -hmm. Some years ago, and I believe that might have been 2000, there was a lot of noise about Burma camp having voted against the outgoing or outgone government of Rawlings. Mm -hmm. okay. There was a big debate. Come 2008, people went to look for the votes cast in Burma camp no. and used the same argument. You see, people are interested <laughs> in the position of the armed forces. Yeah. So yeah. when it's through the ballot box, it's not a big deal. Yeah. But when it is through other means than what is allowed, mm. it becomes a big, a big issue for national security. I have this scenario in my head. Mm. So what if this same guy mm -hmm. had done whatever he did through somebody else and the military had gotten to know mm -hmm. that, you know, this, this you know, thing was powered by this military man. Mm -hmm. Are there sanctions for that as well? Yeah, because he would have been an accessory or he would have been complicit in whatever it is. Hmm. In fact, um, I'm aware of certain messages that were on social media some years ago and the national security apparatus at that time went into it, oh. were able to identify the officer, you know, interrogated by BNI, oh. and then warned. So to be on the safer side, stay away. don't double in politics. Stay out. Exactly. You can double in politics when it is time for elections, and you go and put your cross or whatever and cast it. Oh. That's about, to me, I have a tricky it is, it's very sufficient. <laughs> uh. Citizens, mm -hmm. are military officers citizens. Oh, we are. All right. Mm -hmm. So there is mm -hmm. a mantra. We are primus <laughs> inter pares. We are more <laughs> citizens than all of us. Yes, to the extent oh, that we are prepared to lay down our lives. Being a citizen, not a spectator. Be a citizen, yes. not a spectator. No, not in that context. There is a mantra <laughs> present. Is there any way that there oh, can be know. some. Um, measure to mm. plead with the military mm. um, through the commander-in-chief, the president, on, the, on behalf of this oh, last couple. Man. He has good oh. potential. I oh, see is he going to be used like as a scapegoat? Or will he be used? No, no, no. We, <laughs> there, there is nothing like a scapegoat. Yeah. I cannot tell you my background as here. A, mm. yeah. But from time to time, examples have been set. Yes. Which wouldn't mean that all of us will be dealt with in the same way. Mm -hmm. So some people, like the Calipo example you cited, yeah. probably were not dealt with. Yes, I and yet, were. on balance, yeah. they were all political messages training, that were yeah. being right. sent. But they didn't vocalize, you we were just holding it. So there are simple. ways, going yeah. back to your question, there are ways in which people can reach out to the authorities too. I started by saying that mm. the appropriate superior authority may not necessarily approve of all the 90 days. Okay. 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 But if he chooses to do so, it is within his within. powers. Okay. Now, after that, we come to the administrative volume yeah. that you quoted from. Right. It's now up to the authorities to decide whether the soldier should be released. Huh. Bearing in mind whether his retention and or release or what the implications would be mm -hmm. for retaining him or, or releasing, releasing him. him. Okay. And I believe in this culture that we all belong to, that already people are knocking on doors. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Some churches, some pastors, some chiefs, mm. some whoever, exactly. you know, pleading. And I've heard some room, of the yeah. pleas on radio. But um, the using myself, <laughs> there is life after the uniform. Well, it's unfortunate that he's very young, yes. but there are also benefits. Probably anticipated you know, a long um, career. If he's got some training, yeah, but 
he lives now. Would it be a dishonorable discharge or will or he just be let go? Because that well, also any, might be any in release, the yeah. even for administrative reasons, yes, will be entered on your right. uh, so discharge right. book. Yeah. Yeah. You see, because you were found guilty of an offence. Yeah. Therefore, that dishonorable conduct or dishonorable release will be entered. The other mechanism that he could have, um, it could be immediate, it could be sometime in the future. He could be pardoned, mm -hmm. not by any authority in the armed forces. Okay. Once he's released okay. and the release documents are signed, it now goes beyond the remit of, okay. I stand to be corrected, of the CDS down. Okay. It then now becomes the prerogative of the president okay. immediately or at a future date to grant him a pardon. Okay. You know. Well, Colonel Festus Abadje, we are grateful. I mean, I was really struggling to keep up with all the military terminology, but um, all we can do is, I mean, as you said, um, it's up to the authorities, you know, to decide how long he's going to be detained and how long, whether he's going to be released or, or, or retained in the army. And all we can do is hope for the best. And viewers, you've been listening to Colonel Festus Abwaje. He's a security expert and he's also a consultant for the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center. And he's been giving us more insight into uh, the aftermath of the, the military uh, of, uh, personnel's actions with the Drop That Chamber campaign on social media. We'll be right back after the break with an interview my colleagues previously had with Mr. Koshikedem, former MP for Hohoe South, with regards to the plebiscites and secession. Some members of the secessionist group, Homeland Study Group Foundation, have been arrested and detained by the BNI. But this is not the first time that they have been picked up. Could these claims be masking a more serious condition of neglect and impoverishment of the Volta region? Mr. Kosi Kedem is a former member of parliament from Hohoi South constituency, and he's conversant with the history of the Volta region and the plebiscite which the secessionists base their claim. Welcome to Captured by Women. Thank you very much. Mr. Kenan, now for someone who has been living under a rock, perhaps, and doesn't know that you know, there's some people in Ghana who want to be separated and to be identified as a separate country, perhaps, could you tell our viewers a bit of a history of how this came about and what this action is about? Thank you very much. <clears throat> First of all, I want to caution us that this case is before the court. Yes. So I will play that we discuss the principles and not the details of the case. Because you don't know whether you are crossing the legal border. In this case? Well, in the first place, I'm not a member of their group. Okay. So I don't know whether they are really asking for secession or not. Mm -hmm. But in this particular case, I think the word secession is too strong. Okay. It's too strong. And uh, uh, probably it's a misuse of word. Okay. I think what the people want, I think what they want is attention and appreciation of the problem they have. And maybe over the years, nobody is prepared to listen to what they are saying. And this is the so, Homeland Study Group Foundation. Yes. Yeah. I cannot speak for them, but I'm just speculating that because nobody is prepared to listen to what they are saying, maybe they just want to attract attention to their problem. On so the, to, say the, that, to say that they are working towards secession, secession, the word secession is but, 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 there. But honorable, on, on the day they were picked up from, from Ho and flown to Accra, the initial number of eight, mm. uh, with the leader of the group that were flown into Accra, 
the initial issues tabled were issues of treason because they want to secede. So perhaps that is where the secession is coming from. Mm. Now, the claim for establishing a Western Togoland, in principle, emanates from July in 1958. Yeah. That, is, that is the claim. Which the first, the, the, the first one that was done was days before the Union one for Ghana was done. So in principle, if they are asking that we are to be in union with Ghana, but that instrument has never been sort of ratified, what, is the, what are they talking about? Those two, what, what do they mean by we voted to be in union, but we have never been in union? Give us the principle of that. Yeah. Um, once upon a time, there was uh, the Gold Coast which was a British colony. And then we had the UN Trust Territory of Togoland under the British administration. For short, the British Togoland. Now, the British Togoland um, was part of the German Togoland. The French and then the British conquered German Togoland in 1914, after the colony, the German colony was conquered, um, the French and then the British shared the colonies among them. So we had the Western Togoland and Eastern Togoland. All these uh, territories were put under the uh, United Nations, and we call them mandated territories. Yeah. But after the Second World War, yeah. when the uh, League of Nations was dissolved and the UN was formed, these territories beca uh, became what we call trust territories. Because, just Tr to interrupt you there, the new parliament of Ghana, after you know, Ghana gained independence, adopted the UN resolution to merge and integrate the Transvolta, Togolese land with Ghana, and then they called it the Volta region. So basically, these people are saying the steps weren't taken in order to absorb us. And the government of Ghana is saying, well, with the adoption of the UN resolution, which was based on the fact that 58% of people, you know, voted for the integration of this land, all the necessary steps were taken to absorb you, and therefore you can't necessarily claim sovereignty now, in terms of like, you can't claim that we were never part of you in the first place. No, that's another confusion which is plaguing some people. When you talk about Transvolta Togoland, mm -hmm. Transvolta Togoland was formed only in 1952 mm -hmm. by British ordinance. Mm -hmm. After independence, yes. the name Transvolta Togoland was changed to Volta region. But Volta region and Transvolta Togoland are not the same as Western Togoland. What so, area of land are these people fighting listen, for? Listen, listen. So if the parliament of Ghana mm -hmm. is enacting a law mm -hmm. to absolve <laughs> Transvolta Togoland, that's a different onion altogether. Okay. It has nothing to do with Western Togoland. If the Homeland Study Group Foundation, mm -hmm. we can arguably say they're not just looking for attention, they actually do want to gain some level of independence. Do you think they're going about it the right way? And do they have a chance, just looking at it from the layman's perspective? Well, I've said it already that I don't belong to the group. Of course not. I can't speak for them. Yes. But what I'm trying to explain... But legally, do they have please, a leg to stand on? Uh, unless we understand... You yeah. mentioned, you mentioned the, some the territories. The yes. Western, Western, Western Togoland. Yeah. We, we need the historical premise that we can move. If we don't get the when, history right, we, yes. can't, we, we can't, can't, can't go, go anywhere. Help us. Is, Let's get the history right. That and is then the problem which is plaguing us. Help us understand where Western Togoland is and where Transvolta Togoland is. Western Togoland was a British trust territory. Under the UN, right? And it's extended from what we call a whole, former whole district up to uh, Pusiga in the north, where they had a common border. 
with Burkina Faso. You understand? Mm -hmm. But when you talk about Transvolta Togoland, mm -hmm. Transvolta Togoland, after independence, Volta region, it starts from Krachi district up to Kita. You understand? Mm -hmm. Now, Angro, Kita, Tong, uh, Peki, they were not part That's of yeah. Western Togoland. Togoland. They were not. You see? But people interchange all this were Volta region, yeah. Transvolta Togoland, Western region, yeah. and we are confusing, we are confusing ourselves. Honorable. So, so taking from that, now these, uh, the, the, the secessionists, we would have to leave the name as that because that is the, the, what they are being accused of trying to do. So uh, that's the principle we have to go by. So these secessionists, what they are even claiming for covers areas that were not in the original uh, Togoland. When you listen to them, they have areas in German Togoland, they have the Western Togoland, mm. then they have the Katanko who were even in Gold Coast and did not vote on that. And they are tracing the issue from Kulungugu in the north. Yeah. Kusiga coming down down by all those places up to the vote, up to the south. So the, the, the issue is are they coordinated enough? And is this a legitimate claim? That is just what in mm -hmm. short well, mm -hmm. is it a legitimate claim? It's a good question. Well, I don't know whether it is legitimate or not, but what I know is that there's a little bit of confusion there. Exactly. Because if you are talking about Western Togoland and you are including South Eastern Gold Coast colony as well, then probably there's some confusion there. Yeah. yeah. And uh, probably they need some education on the issue. Themselves. Now, talking about... Uh, uh, Western Togoland itself, and I, I, and I want to clarify this situation. Yes. You see, in um, 1956, there was a plebiscite yeah. which was ordered by the UN Resolution 944. Now, the plebiscite was conducted, it was organized by the British, administered by the British, and supervised by the UN. Now, the majority of the inhabitants said so they wanted a union with the Gold Coast. Do you understand? Yes. But you agree with me that the results alone did not no, constitute no. a union. It was 45-55. Or the result alone could not translate automatically into a union. So resolution 1044 of the UN directed the British to take such steps as were necessary to bring about the, the union. union. That is where the problem starts exactly. from. Because the British did not take any constitutional steps to bring about the union, and what they did was rather to forcibly integrate a Western Togoland into the Gold Coast. That is what people are concerned about. So people keep on asking the question, yes, if you say there was a union, where is the union document? Right. This was a map used to divide German Togoland between the French and the British. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at this German Togolan, you see this column here, Gold Coast colony, uh, intrudes into it. So you can see that this map, the, the territory of uh, German Togolan did not reach the shores. Now, there we have the Anglons and Tong people who were originally part of the Gold Coast. So if somebody is now claiming that this part was also part of German, we can see the map. Yes, they were the not. Then this one, this is the map of the Gold Coast. You see the map of the Gold Coast? Mm -hmm. You see, even in 1902, Kita and all those people, they were part of the Gold Coast. Eh? They were not yes. part of the Western Togoland. So if somebody is now saying that this part which were part of the Gold Coast, were part of the uh, Western Togoland. The person is misleading us. Yes. You understand? Then you take the map of uh, 1950. Yeah. You see? This is the Gold Coast, and this is the Western, Western Togoland. Togoland. Yeah, that's why it's from Burkina Faso. You top see? Top here. Yeah. Burkina Faso. Yes. Still, you can see that Kita and Adenu were not part of it. Yeah. You understand? So 
there's a lot of distortion and uh, okay. then this one, 1952. <laughs> okay. We don't want to yeah. yeah. 1952. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You see the map. So it has come down small. They took some uh -huh. from the top. When the transporter to Golan was created yes. in 1952. Yes. This is the map now. Mm -hmm. Then after 1960. Yes. 60. Yes, see the map. The voter mm -hmm. region. So it's coming down. Small, no, it's the same thing. It's the same thing like, like transporter to Golan. But after independence, the name was changed to Volta region. region. So yeah. you can still see that it's not the same yeah. as what's in the yeah. uh, So we've just been talking about the Homeland Study Group Foundation, which you know are secessionists um, planning on breaking away from Ghana. Too and strong the word. Although the Honourable would say it's far too strong a word, and we've just been discussing with Honourable Kedem, who has given us a fantastic history lesson on this, as well as the context, including the political context. Um, so we just hope it's all resolved quite soon, and that dialogue, conversation, and listening to people, perhaps, will just take this conversation to the next level without people breaking away from us. Thank you. Ladies, what were your highlights for this episode? Uh, for me, I was quite intrigued with uh, the military um, sort of regiments and, um, you know, the established rules of engagement. I, I think that a lot of people have an idea that, you know, the military has these, but you don't know exactly, you know, what they are. And it's, it's good for us to have known, you know, what constitutes and discipline or offensive behavior in the military. That was quite insightful for me. And um, as well, uh, the issue with the special prosecutor, I, I think that we, you know, we've all left corruption in this country, you know, the big C word on his shoulders to carry. And I think that's quite unfair. I think that I would make a personal call for whoever is in authority and is supposed to help resource the man. And um, also for the heads of these institutions that are giving him all the the headache and the trouble. I think he's genuinely facing challenges and um, we, we can't take that for granted. I think he needs a lot of support to get the job done. Zaina? Yeah. Well, in my case, you know, as a civilian, when I watched that video, I didn't see what the guy had done wrong. Yeah. You know, but Kenan Labwaji actually made me know that as a military man, you don't have the same luxury, luxury as a private citizen. Yeah. You know, there are rules and regulations, rules of engagement you need to follow because yeah. if you don't then we'll end up with chaos with regards to the special prosecutor i think we need to let him just do his job yeah it takes time the truth always takes time to come out he needs to do his thing systematically yeah. he needs to take his time we mm. can't have him rushing and have it thrown out of court mm. only for him to go back again and like you said he needs all the help he can get yeah heads of state must comply Whoever needs to give him information must do so. And yeah. if his office needs to be staffed, let's staff it. Mm. We're okay. ready to pay money to do something that we don't think is yeah. important. You know, yeah. This for us should be more important than I, anything. I, I don't know how much more time Eliza is going to give me, but I just wanted to make a quick... Um, I took this uh, uh, interest in, in the issue of the plebiscite and the secessionist. I think this, this is not the first time it's come up. It's come up quite a few times over the years, and uh, this dates back to independence and I personally believe that this will not be the last that mm -hmm. we'll see of, of this, oh, yeah, um, this that, issue yeah. of Volta, mm -hmm. Togoland and so on. I think that um, we have to quash it you know once and for all to make sure that this never happens again. again. They've been released for now but um, of course we don't know the intricacies of, of what will happen after but I, I do not think I think there's still people in the Volta region that think that, that they should pushing. be Great. It's been a wonderful discussion. This, this has been a very engaging episode on mm -hmm. Captured by Women. Our program was proudly sponsored by Woodin Le Createur. Follow Woodin Fashion on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Our location set by the kind courtesy of Emerald Properties. See you next week, same time on Captured by Women.